All right, and with that, I will run away. Um, it is absolutely my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Martijn de Hammer, and I'm sure that's about as brutal as an American can screw up that name. Um, he is the head of the National Cybersecurity Operations Center at NCSCNL. Um, many of us old timers remember that as GovCert NL. <laughs> um, and after having various roles in the field of information security, he started working there in 2005. Um, he's also been very active in the field of CCERT maturity and working there. So I am very excited to hear what he has to say. Martijn. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Um, so STIX 2.0 is technology, so I'm not going to talk about that or mention it in, in any way today. Um, I'm actually going to talk about um, uh, CSERP maturity. Um, I'm a runner, and I'm in a team that runs from Paris to, Ro to Rotterdam uh, every year. Uh, unfortunately, I was unable to do so this year because of health issues, but last year I did. And uh, last year was the first time my team, team ran from Paris to Rotterdam. For those of you that don't know the distance, it's about 520K running from Paris to Rotterdam, which is quite a feat. Uh, we do this with eight people in two teams, and the complete team is 25 people. It takes about 48 hours, and it's a nonstop relay. Um, wh while preparing for this talk, I was also preparing simultaneously for this run, and it struck me that there are quite a number of similarities uh, between preparing for a run and preparing for uh, a C-cert and making sure that your C-cert uh, becomes mature. So um, basically, the first one is that you need to learn from others. You need to stand on the shoulders of giants. So we learned very quickly how not to do stuff by copying, for example, scripts from other teams. Um, the, the next thing is that you need to keep on measuring your speed. So measure to see how you're standing to, uh, in relation to your goal which is quite important, otherwise you're not gonna make the cutoff of 11K per hour. So we aimed for 11.3K per hour this year, and the heroes that ran the, uh, the, the course actually ran 11.6K per hour. Um, the reason why we're doing this is for a good cause. We're actually collecting money for, uh, for people that have cancer, and for the, not the cure for cancer, but for the care for cancer patients. Um, that's why we're you know, doing this, and we're very invested in, in this topic. The last um, parallel, basically, is that you need to um, practice, practice, practice. Uh, without doing the practice, you have no idea what you're doing along the way. And this is also something we see in setting up CSERT and running a CSERT. I can tell you when, you, when you're driving down from The Hague, going to Paris, and you're in a car that goes at 120K per hour, and you're in that car for about four and a half, five hours, you really get a feel uh, for the distance. And it definitely helps keeping your sanity, knowing that you've got a process, you've practiced, you know you're going to be able to do this, uh, because otherwise, you know, it's, it's like eating an elephant, you need to take one step at a time. The same goes for setting up a CSET and becoming more mature as a CSET. Now let's start with the main message. Um, first of all, we're all interlinked, which means that uh, we help ourselves by helping others. So if one team, um, we here as established teams, we all need each other. So when I know uh, what you do with my information and if, when I know what your information is coming from and what you've been doing to get that information, uh, we can help each other in a better way. By helping other teams set up, we can kickstart them in, in the process where they um, become, become more uh, mature and their information becomes more valuable, basically. Then maturity is not about technology. We love the tech. Obviously, I mean, we, we, we all love PCAPs and we love the PCAP wizards and we need the tech. But talking about maturity is about talking about processes. It's about uh, talking about government, uh, governance. Um, you need to practice. You need to have your, your, your um, uh, when the going gets tough, you need to know what you're doing. That's what, what, what maturity, maturity is about. And it's also about measuring and, and proving your maturity and having a goal towards your maturity, uh, maturity level. And also, Make sure that you don't revert back to a two-year-old situation where you have uh, you've set up your C-cert, you've been uh, going at it for, for a number of years, and without knowing it, without realizing it, you revert back to the, uh, the, the C-cert that you were when you were 16 years ago, uh, not very, very mature. So beware of the Benjamin Button effect, basically. Now, as to the why, uh, why we're doing this, there's a, a group of organizations and people, 
it's a bit of a pity that the, the image is a bit dark, um, because we believe uh, th there's a group of people that work on this. It's FIRST, it's INISA, it's, it's others, more on, on, on those organizations later. Um, but we believe in an open and free and secure internet. And we believe that we cannot do this alone. That's why we believe that we need to have teams stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, we're the giants and we hope that others uh, will be able to stand on our shoulders, look further than we have, and set up quickly. Also, we see a need for, um, for, for more teams, be it legislation, be it uh, a government assignment, be it some, something else. There's a great number of new and future, future teams. So there's a great need of, of more information sharing and, and more um, helping others set up. Now, the last one, which ties in with the Benjamin Button reference, is th the current approach might not be as effective, we have noticed as NCFC, uh, as we thought. So after going, about, uh, going at it for 18 years, we now realize that maybe you know, we're still telling people to do very basic stuff, which might not be the best. So apparently, uh, there's something wrong with our message, or there's something we need to change, need to change in our message to help our, our constituents. Now, there's a, um, in the CSET community and in the security community, there's a lot going on about uh, capacity building. And capacity building is, is a, a very wide term and can basically seen, uh, be seen as, well, in, you can divide the, the activities into four, four basic topics. That's policy, policy and strategy. There's excellent people working on in, in that area. Uh, there's a matrix improvement, as in laying a mesh of CSERTs and security teams over the world, um, again, helping us by helping others. Uh, and there's the operations. So how do you do the stuff you need to be doing to keep your uh, constituency secure? Um, and in this talk, we're going to be focusing on CSERT maturity, because that's the topic we've been working with a great number of people. And we've seen an, an increased focus in this area. So um, these organizations have all uh, been active, or are all active, in, in um, helping others become more mature. And we're talking about maturity, uh, it says here, is it's not about the technology, it's about, how, about the governance. How well does uh, a team govern itself? Um, how well does it document itself? How well does, does it measure itself? How well does it look at itself and, and make sure that you actually do the stuff you need to be doing? On the other hand, um, we are a bit of a puzzle as teams. So um, as a community here, we all know the, the, um, the value of having a security team or a CSERT or a PSERT. However, explaining this to your management or to the board or to policy level, um, we found a bit of a challenge in that uh, talking to them long enough will eventually make it sink in. But for new teams, it's very difficult to explain why you need to uh, spend a lot of money to set up a team and not really being able to explain what you get in return for it. S some teams are very fortunate. I know of one team in, in my country that also does fraud prevention. And you know, uh, doing fraud prevention actually quantifies the, 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 the return on investment very, um, very easily because you, you can see uh, uh, the, 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 level, the, the amount of money going down. You, s you see how much fraud you've prevented. But for a national team, for example, or a, a, a government team, uh, you're just there to help people and you don't earn any money. So how do you go about explaining uh, what you do and why you need to do it? Also, not only for the money, it's also about uh, explaining to your, your, your legal counsel why you need to do the stuff you need to do and how, why it doesn't work to simply sign a document and poof, there's automatic uh, uh, trust. Uh, you need to invest in, in, your, uh, in your team. You need to invest in the relations. Um, so that, that's an... Uh, an interesting, an interesting discussion. I've been having quite a lot of discussions with my, my legal counsel because we're in this legislation path, uh, and it really helps in having the community behind me in bringing the message, saying that, all right, what we've done in the community, actually, uh, this is the, the standard, or this is going towards the standard, and um, this is why uh, legislation will need to you know, be adapted to fit this, and not the other way around. There have been a couple of milestones done already. This is definitely not all of them. Um, what I can tell you, the first, the first brush I had with, with um, um, CSERT maturity was in 2006. I started working there in two, in, at uh, GovCert in 2005, as Derek already mentioned. Um, the first thing we did when I was there is, is publish the CERT in a box. 
um, CD. It was actually a physical CD. It was tinned, so you had this cute little tin where you could you know, take the, the, the CD out, put it in your very old fashion. It was very nice. But it explained the process of how Gosset and L actually set up and something about our legal processes and about how we go about um, telling our constituency um, uh, about the threats, about advisories. Um, then, obviously, since 2008, there's the SIM3 model, which is the, the, the model that will help a team, a security team, measure and, and um, get an insight into their maturity. It's the, the maturity model that we've, uh, as TFC Cert and as Trusted Introducer, have adopted, as GovCertNL slash NCCNL. Uh, we're quite proud to say that we were the first one to be actually certified with this model. And it's proved to be a very good basis for teams to measure themselves. Now, in the group of people, the people that I mentioned before uh, that we're working together with, uh, we've done a number of things. Those are the things. Uh, we've done something, the GFCE has done something with a, uh, uh, an initiative. More on this a bit later. Uh, we're thinking about the typology for C-certs. Now, this is quite interesting and necessary, even though at first we didn't really expect this. Uh, then we thought about definition for a national CSERT. So why would you need a definition for a national CSERT? But it appears to be very useful, or at least we found so. Um, we've had a CSERT maturity kit. It says model here, but it's, it's a kit really. It's a document, uh, a guide of guides basically to help others set up, uh, which was published in the, well, the, in 2015, we had the Global Forum on Cyberspace in The Hague, and this is one of the deliver deliverables that we published there helping other teams. This was done in the group as well. Um, and we've been publishing a baseline, so helping others form a, um, a, a roadmap, basically, for, for the levels that they want to go to. We've been involved in uh, various global and regional activities, so helping CSERTs and giving them the materials that we've been creating and, and speaking to them, reaching out, asking them what they need. And uh, at the end, there's the GFCE manifesto, which is basically a, a, a nice bow around the, around the documents, around the stuff um, that is going to be drawn up by the GFCE. That's a lot of policy work, a lot of legal work. Still, it's very necessary to get the, the buy-in from the right levels. And the potential next step is uh, giving more handle to you know, the tools that new and, and, and future teams can actually use. Um, to... to to place it in, in, in an order, this is basically the, um, uh, the, the, the picture. First, you need the typology uh, because you need to know which type of CSERT there, th there are. Uh, then you'd like to know, all right, I'm this type of CSERT. What do I need to do then? What's my definition? Then based on the definition, you might want to think about what services could, services could I provide to my constituency? And then how do I go about filling in this task of offering these services and making a re resilient organization? And then helping with that is the baseline. Now, um, as I said, the bow around this is going to be the GFCE manifesto, uh, which will probably be pub published somewhere later this year or maybe start of next year. And uh, the very solid and firm basis for all this work is the SIM3 model. In 2015, we had the uh, Global Forum on Cyber Expertise in, sorry, the Global Conference on Cyberspace in Holland, in, in The Hague. Um, and we... As a deliverable, we delivered the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise. So that's a, a podium, basically, where organizations and countries can uh, start initiatives on particular topics. Uh, with a group, uh, in initially starting as uh, Microsoft, OAS, ITU, and the Netherlands, and the Dutch government, uh, we started the CSAP Maturity Initiative. And fortunately, the group grew uh, very quickly. Um, and we're aimed at, as I said, uh, policy and board level to make sure that the right message and uh, lens, lands at the right uh, level. We've had a number of uh, expert meetings where we discussed various topics. So, um, for example, all the topics you saw just now, we discussed why would this be necessary, why would this be relevant, and what is already there, because the last, last thing we want to do is use or reinvent the wheel. We want to use the stuff that's already there, and we also want to align with the stuff, with the initiatives that have, have been going on. As to the typology, um, it's good to know what type of C-cert, P-cert uh, security team you are, because it gives you an identity and it, it, it allows you to base your, 
your, your founding documents on. So, for example, in my case, I worked for the national, gov uh, national um, uh, uh, sea cert of the Netherlands. And doing this, knowing what a national sea cert is, more or less, um, I can tell my, my constituents and my, my management what we need to be doing. We're currently working on a document uh, to describe what types of sea cert there really are. So you've got the national ones, you've got the product search, you've got the regional search, you've got the sectoral search. And there's a bit of a movement that, that, that proves the, or at least in Holland, that proves the, the, the value of this piece of text. And that is that we see uh, sectoral search. For example, for example the, care, the care sector is now um, um, unifying or combining themselves in, 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 in a search. So we'd like to help them by providing um, uh, documents and providing guidance on, on how to set up a cert, but they need to know what they are first so they know what services they can, um, they can provide to their constituency. Then it helps to have a definition. And uh, there have been many, there are many descriptions of a national CSA, but no one really knows what they really are. It's, if, if you ask, ask 10 people, you get 10 different definitions of a national CSA. There have been excellent documents written by excellent and very uh, experienced organizations. So, for example, it's the Carnegie Mellon Institute that wrote in their, in their uh, Steps for Creating National CSERT a good description of what a national CSERT is. Inisa has got their take on a national CSERT. Um, ITU has got their own take on a national CSERT. But there's not one, one um, uh, accepted, basically, by the, government, uh, sorry, by the, by the um, uh, community definition of national CSERT. Now, this is relevant for the people in Europe because we've got an NIS di directive, which is the Network Information Security Directive that explains how the 28 member states need to go about securing their stuff. In Holland, we, we feel the same pain. We've got local legislation coming our way, which is excellent, which really defines what we're allowed to do. But um, we consider ourselves to be the national CSERT, and our lawyers say, well, yeah, right, that's fine. Tell me what is a national CSERT. And we say, um, we don't really know because there's no text saying this is a national CSET. And when you start talking to your legal counsel, we think it's this and this. Yeah, that's very nice what you think, but what does the established text say? So that's why we're working on, on, on this definition, and we're looking to do more definitions as soon as we have the typology and identified a number of other uh, types of CSET. Obviously, uh, as soon as we have a text, which is being drafted right now, or, or somewhere in the, in the, in the near future, uh, we're going to do the, you know, the process of, of establishing, of, of um, asking for feedback and, and, and asking your opinions on, on what do you think is the national C cert uh, definition? Is this, is this a good one? And this is the one you feel. Do we have consensus on this definition? So it's going to take a while before we actually get consensus, but we think it's really important that the first community agrees with this definition, simply because it helps us. The services framework originally included in the uh, 2003, I believe, document of, of the Carnegie Mellon Institute, um, explains the services that uh, CSERT can offer to its constituents. Now, the, the, the text is old and first uh, has started in, in, in an initiative or an action a couple of years ago with the um, education summit where we started to redefine uh, the services framework. That was a very thorough and very good, very wide discussion where we uh, went back to the definitions of what is a service, what is an action, um, how do they, do they relate to each other, and the old services, uh, are they complete? And if so, how do they, is it, it, is it a service or is it merely an action, and how, how do we describe that? On the 24th of May, uh, the 1.1 version of this document was published, and this is a document that came about in, in excellent discussions with uh, a lot of you in, in, in the room. We've had a number of meetings over, over the last uh, couple of years. Um, so this is something to build on when starting up a new cert or, or helping uh, a recently started up cert. During the um, GCCS, as I said, we published a document uh, geared towards helping starting and new C cert set up. So uh, what we did is we took the experience, we le tried to leverage the experience from all the people that cooperated on this, and it's a wide group. I've got a list of people that cooperated on it a, a bit later on. Um, it's a very wide group of people, that, and, and they all um, lent us their experience. 
So basically what this document became is a guide of guides. So we didn't write anything new, we just pointed towards existing documents, the, the, the right and, and uh, established documents that are still being maintained by the teams, and in this way combining years and years of experience uh, in one guide. What we also did is provide a solid foundation. So the SIM3 model is, is the foundation for this document, um, allowing people to at least have a bit of structure, have some guidance in the SIM3 maturity model, and should they uh, consider uh, certification or peer review or, or of any kind, they've, got, they've pre sorted because of the structure they used to set up, they've pre sorted for you know, being able to do this, um, the assessments. What it also does is it provides case studies. So all the errors that we've made as established teams, um, they should at least be aware of them. They need to make the mistakes, obviously, but you need to have someone around when you re recover from them. These were also, uh, are also described in, in this document. And um, one more thing is that there is some stuff that is kept under the radar, or is, is really easy to forget when you're starting up. So for example, your legal stuff, your communication stuff, how do you, how do you involve um, uh, your legal friends. Uh, this is described in there as well because it's one of the, it's, it's some of the things you need to be doing uh, if you want to have a solid foundation to build your, your, your C-cert upon before you start offering services to your uh, constituency. And again, this was, you know, the only way to go about this sort of stuff is to use the community and, and use the experience in the community uh, to make sure that you uh, have a decent and a, a, a uh, a, st a sturdy document that allows people to learn from others. And obviously, we all know, I mean, beginning is tough. Well, when we started out, we, we you know, invented the wheel ourselves. We, we, uh, we, we uh, borrowed uh, our CMS from, from Osset, for example. Uh, so anything we needed to do, we did. Um, and we've made mistakes, and now we're helping others trying to recover from those mistakes as well. Um, and it's a matter of, you know, uh, repeating the stuff you do. Uh, the cake here is, um, was, was the, the picture was sent to me by Art Jochem. Uh, probably many of you know him. He, he used to work for GOSRTNL and NCSCNL. He moved on to a, a different company, uh, a company that was not very aware of security and was not very resilient in that way, though they deal with lots of money. He was able to uh, convince them to set up a C-cert. And that's not a, not, a, not a trivial feat because those people didn't really realize what the CSERT community was. They didn't really know why you need to be aware of the threat from outside and what, how you could leverage the community in, in doing the stuff you do. So within a couple of months, using the document, that document, um, he was able to uh, have a mandate from, from, from the board, uh, have his documents, have his, his processes rubber stamped, uh, have his first um, uh, exercises uh, planned, have a PGP, not only a key, but also a process of, of generating the key, and he's got the cake. Um, and, or at least in, in Holland, we think cake is, is, is the cornerstone of, of uh, running our C-cert because we have so much cake that we often feel that as soon as the cake leaves, uh, Holland will fall, basically. It's a bit like the ravens in, in the Tower of London. As soon as the ravens leave, England will fall. That's, you know, we, so we keep pushing cake. Measuring your stuff, measuring what you're doing is very important. So in this race that we did, uh, as you can see here, the, this, this is a schedule of all the changing points where the old team of runners meets the new team of runners. You need to maintain a steady 11.3k per hour um, to make sure that you make those points at those times. Um, you need to, in the process, I mean, preparing for this run takes about a year, and in the process, you need to measure uh, the, the speed of your, of your runners, of your cyclist, uh, because uh, you need to know whether or not you're gonna make this. And the same holds true for, for a CSAT. If you've got your goal, and if you, if you know where you wanna be, if you wanna have a particular level of maturity, you need to keep measuring uh, the points in between and, and being very critical in the process. And that's why, um, there has been uh, a working group in the EU CSERTs network uh, that deals with uh, a baseline. Um, based on the SIM3 model, uh, there's a set of values um, that you need to get for particular, there, okay, there are 44 um, variables uh, in, the, um, in the SIM3 model. 
And for each of those variable, variables, you can have either uh, a score of one through four, and where four being the best, and, uh, sorry, zero through four, and zero being non-existent, and four being the best. More on this a bit later. Um, so for a national or a government C cert, we've actually uh, defined those levels. And that helps new and starting teams, because they, in that way, they know where to aim their focus, where to, where to um, uh, you know, invest more time, or think, right, we're at the right level at the moment. Uh, what's also included in the, in, the, in, the, in the baseline is that there's a possibility for either self-assessment, which is always good, uh, but also a peer review. So if there's a particular team you trust, uh, or y you can ask them in and so show them your, your processes. If there's a particular team you don't trust, and you don't want to have them in your organization, just leave them out. You can, uh, in any way you like, uh, do measure, measure your own uh, progress. What this helps is um, it, it helps provide a roadmap. So if you measure yourself and you, you discover I'm not a basic, or I'm, I'm at a basic level at the moment and I'd like to be in the intermediate level, um, you know which variables or which, which parameters you need to improve on. So that gives you uh, basically the roadmap uh, towards the next level of certification. And even though it's j created for the EU CSETS network, obviously it's open for all. Um, you know, uh, reach out to me in, uh, after the talk if you'd like to know more about this or reach out to any of the team, um, more names on the board later, if you'd like to know more about this because it really helps teams as a whole to measure their maturity. This is the template for a government slash national team. So any government slash national team, uh, they can basically start um, learning how they stand. Uh, are they basic level of maturity, intermediate level of maturity, or certifiable level of maturity? Um, and these are the 44 or 45 questions, each with the uh, value that you need to score in order to, make, to, to achieve a particular level of, of maturity. Now some, one example, um, this is a question on uh, service description. So it's completely illegible, so I'll, I'll read out the first sentence. What services are you, um, what are the services that your CSERT offers, uh, offers to their constituency? Do you have it clearly described? Do you know implicitly but don't talk about it? Do you actually talk about it? So each of the levels, uh, you, you can see the values there. So value one is no, it's never discussed. Uh, value two is uh, we know what we offer, but we don't really we haven't really written it down. Um, level two is yes, we have written it down, but it, you know it, it's just an informal document. Uh, level three is yes, we've written it down, we've published it, and everyone knows it in the in the in the organisation. So if you don't comply with it, um, we'll have a good discussion. And level four is uh, the same as level three, but then with the uh, rubber stamps, the the annual audit. Uh, and the, uh, the assessments going on on, on this uh, level. And if you go about uh, answering all the 44 or 45 questions, you get an idea of how your spider graph will actually look for your organization. All these experiments and activities and, and, and pieces of text uh, are very good and well. Uh, what we've also done, or at least the GFC has, has taken up the task of visiting um, regions and, and, and countries and setting up um, uh, meetings. For example, a couple of, a couple of years ago, or sort of, I think about a year ago or something, we went to, uh, to Western Africa uh, There was a, in, in Senegal. There was a, uh, a regional meeting for the GFCE where we met loads of countries, uh, their ministers and the people working on cybersecurity. And we spoke to them about these initiatives, about how do you measure your current worth? How do you, you know, how do you know how fertile the bottom is that you're gonna, gonna plant the sea cert on? How do you know um, how it's gonna land with policy? Do you have a policy? Do you have a, a national cybersecurity strategy, for example? Um, it really helps in getting an overview on the, on the, on the countries um, where they stand. And what we noticed, that even, even countries that have had major issues in, in the past, also in Western Africa, they're now very much aware of the need for cybersecurity, because, be it because they see money hemorrhage, hemorrhaging away from their country because of fraud, or be it because they see um, cybersecurity, oh, sorry, the internet as being, as being the, the, uh, the stimulus for growth in their country, economic growth, for example, they see the need for uh, setting up a CSET, and that's why we as a community, I think, need to help them set up. 
Another good thing, which is uh, a bit slow at the moment, but uh, it will probably uh, speed up again in, in some time, is that the EU, the European Union, European Union um, has been working on a tender for, uh, for helping a couple of countries uh, worldwide set up their CSERT as well. So here is another initiative where we can see that Europe is also seeing the need for helping others set up and helping countries set up, making effectively our job a lot easier if, if they grow to a certain level of maturity. Now, as this is a complete, you know, it, they're, they're, they're loose activities, basically. So what the GFC is doing at the moment is they're tying a bow around the work we've been doing, making, a nice, making it a nice uh, policy document, which will, well, in my case, it will help me convince uh, our policy level, saying this is what we need to do, this is why we need to invest. But also it might help convince the policy level of the countries that are in need of a CSERT, a national CSERT, or any other type of CSERT. Um, to set up and do the investment, uh, because you know, doing the investment, getting the money for something that you don't really know what's going to, going to, uh, it's not going to contribute to your core business, and it costs a lot of money. So it's, it's, this will probably help bring across the message why it's important. Having said that, that um, this was all for teams that are only starting the adolescents, basically. Now, looking at myself. Uh, we've been, as a team, active for about 18 years. I've been involved in a team for about 12. Um, and I must say, probably holds true for a lot of you here as well, there are many, many established teams, uh, and we have years of, of experience. So we've been working together for, for a great number of years. Uh, and we've been doing all the stuff that we need to do. We've, been, we've got a process. We've been, we've been measure, measuring our maturity. We've been looking at ourselves. We've been doing the practice. Um, and yet that might not be enough because we noticed some stuff recently or o over the last year that made me think that we might not be doing the right things per se. We might need to change our approach a bit. This looks quite easy. The process of you know, uh, one runner running for 2K, uh, tagging next, the next runner, uh, and after 2K, the, the person gets into a bus, 2K f further down the road, the, the next runner will be tagged again. Um, the more complex thing is where the, 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 the vans are not allowed on the, on the course of the Roper run. So there you need to have three bikes, four runners, and each runner does 2K, takes a bike, next runner goes, etc. These processes need to, be, need, need to be practiced, especially because, you know, theoretically they're, they're quite all right. But when you're there in north of Paris and it's rush hour and it's very busy and you're tired and, you know, you're, you're, you're all pumped up because you, you're going to do this run, um, life is a bit more difficult. All the, the basic stuff is not as easy as it once seemed. And I think the same holds true for, uh, for running a CSERT. So when, for example, a mayor of a municipality or if, 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 if the board is, uh, is breathing down your neck and saying, can we work again tomorrow morning? Um, life is not as simple as simply resolving an incident. So that's why you need to practice. You, you, need, you need to not think at that moment. You need to have thought before that so that you know your hands will do the automatic, automatic work uh, when the going is tough. For ourselves, uh, this is a very oldie. I'm, I'm terribly sorry to reuse this again because it's, it's been way overused. Uh, but still, this was a moment where we thought, all right, this is interesting. Die Genoter 2011, that was the, the, the only national crisis that the Netherlands had. Um, that was caused by the, one of the uh, root certificate providers. Um, they got compromised. Uh, big time. And in the beginning, we thought, well, you know, we're going to handle this uh, as an incident and it shouldn't be a problem. Then, um, after handling the incident for about three days, we started to notice that our incident handler or the, 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 the manager that did, that did the, 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 the overall work, he started to look really, really ill uh, because he'd been working for three days nonstop. And then we realized we might want to need to send him home. And, oh yeah, be, uh, perhaps all the sweet stuff that we have there might not be the best food for handling an incident. So the sugar fiber ratio was a bit on the sweet side. Uh, and this is the stuff we learned when we uh, dealt with this, uh, this incident. So what it boils down to basically is that you need to see the bigger picture. Uh, you need to be able to, to, to realize that it's, it's not in the process. You need to see the, the outside world. In the case of Diginota, for example, we thought, well, this is, you know, it's sad that you won't be able to talk to, to our local IRS anymore in a secure way. 
And then we started to realize that it's more than just the IRS, it's also the communications between our, our um, um, in, in the, 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 the harbor of Rotterdam. So they need to uh, talk to our customs department. And if that communication doesn't, c cannot be guaranteed anymore, and if, if, the, if the trust in the certificates are revoked, we simply cannot get the stuff into Holland. Same goes for passengers through our national airport. So they talk, they talk to customs in a secured way. Um, if we can't have flights enter and, 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 and leave our country, um, that's going to have a major impact on our, you know, on our organization. So it took us a while to see the bigger picture there. And what we also realized is that we needed to very quickly uh, start onboarding friends. So we started onboarding our uh, DOD cert, for example, to, to maintain the daily operations. We started to get uh, people from, from one of our national uh, PKI providers to start reviewing and writing the stuff on, uh, uh, on PKI, PKI, what was actually going on, because we had no PKI experts at the moment, but we knew where to get the, um, get the information. So what we saw there is the, uh, the bigger picture uh, is really about including the friends that you have and also seeing your, your, um, the stuff that you haven't arranged yet. Another example uh, in, in this case is uh, a, go a good friend of the show of the NCSC that we do a lo lot of work with uh, gave me an example in that um, th they received a threat, a cybersecurity threat, on one of their plants. Uh, they've got plants across Europe and um, there's a lot of ICS data stuff going on there on those plants and they received a threat saying, right, we've got this uh, ICT threat. Uh, there, there's probably a, a possibly violent actor that is about to do some stuff. Uh, what they did is they didn't simply send in the IT guy or the, the, the incident responder. They sent, um, along with him, they sent a team of uh, physical security experts and ICS SCADA experts. When they went to the site, they didn't really see the actual threat, but they saw issues. So th they started measuring um, the Wi-Fi network in relation to the physical perimeter, for example. They started looking at the, at the ICS SCADA components. How does it fit in with uh, the rest of the IT stuff? And what they ended, ended up with was uh, a set of recommendations, not so much for the, um, for the IT stuff, which would not really have landed in the organization itself, but they saw the bigger picture and they were able to um, have a set of recommendations that was applicable to the whole, uh, whole of the organization and also for more than one um, uh, plant. So taking care of their neighbors, they also thought about, right, we've got a number of plants that have the same setup, more or less. Um, and uh, we need to secure them in this way. So helping your neighbors and, and, and making sure that you see the bigger picture and including all the people, that's a good thing. That's a, one of the signs of, of maturity. And as I said just now, Govcert and Nell started up um, as a very immature team, obviously. Um, we had help from great friends, many of whom are actually in the room. Um, but we started you know, uh, making, making errors and making uh, um, uh, running into things and, and granted for some for some issues you need to you know fall down and, and recover again uh, because that's the only way to learn but some stuff you can we, we can help you with so for example we had the tech only view we we did um, start writing procedures for each and every new type of incident that we that we ran into uh, we had no idea what we were doing basically and now that we know we it's it's good to have written them down and help others uh, prevent those you know rocky starts Over the last couple of years, in order to become a bit more mature, um, what we did is a couple of steps. So we had the formal inspection of our advisories, our tech advisories, uh, which um, was done by a, a formal inspection body in the Dutch government. And all the stuff they told us about is the stuff that we uh, have been changing in our tech advisories. So having a good look at ourselves. Um, we are currently, in, in the next week, we're up for the the second recertification of the, of, of the SIM3 certification, which is uh, having a, a thorough look at yourself as well. So um, making sure that you have your processes in place, et cetera. Uh, make sure that you don't revert back to um, the situation of a couple of years ago. We had the 24 seven, seven operations, which was interesting. Um, we invested a year and a half in, in setting it up, doing it, and discovering that we were not ready for 24 seven operations on site because simply 
with our constituency, there, were, there, there, was, there were not enough incidents that were um, serious enough to have well-educated, um, very critical and, and very technically sound staff uh, on site. So with the risk of boring those people away uh, and with the risk of you know, not being able, to, being able to find skilled IT security staff, um, we decided, or government, uh, sorry, um, uh, management decided to roll back the, the uh, decision to not do 24-7 operations anymore. We are 24-7 available and we are 24-7 reachable in the sense that any, any keywords that pop up in our, in our mailbox or our other systems, you know, they make sure that someone gets called awake, but we have now extended office hours. So again, a, a very critical look at, at ourselves. Uh, we increased the talk to our constituency. Um, we are currently working on uh, a national detection network, which is key in actually seeing what's going on in your constituency networks, because other otherwise you're blind. We're also doing stuff in, in uh, threat intel, etc. Uh, so we're improving there as well, seeing or, or you know improving the what we see and being able to respond more quickly. Um, we have a very close relationship with our constituency and we have liaisons that visit us about every week. So liaisons from uh, various sectors, from other uh, government organizations, etc. And we share information uh, about um, very uh, current uh, uh, affairs. So for example, if we have something that might, you know, reek of espionage, we start calling the secret service, our secret service, or if it might be something that has something to do with um, cyber crime, We've got the police department on speed dial, for example. Also, uh, as I mentioned, we've got uh, specific legislation coming our way, which means that we're going towards um, um, uh, the NIS directive. We've got our Dutch translation, our local law for this, which means that we're allowed to deal with particular kinds of personal information, which is also regulated in the general data protection regulation in the, I, uh, the EU and it's only going to get more strict. So we, we have it uh, embedded in the law that we're allowed to do particular stuff when we need to do particular stuff. And we also have a particular exempt from, we're exempted from, from the FOIA, which means that in particular uh, situations, we're not even allowed to give information uh, when we receive a Freedom of Information Act uh, request. So that's all very good. It's all, it's all you know, we, we're doing our work. What we notice is that um, we might not be reaching our constituency really well because uh, you probably recognize that picture there as well. Um, during the WannaCry thing, um, we still needed to tell, to tell organizations that they needed to patch. So it's, it's a, we got the feeling, do we really reach out to our constituency enough and do we really get the message across? Also, looking back to the real world, th there have been a, a lot of changes. So we've been doing all the good stuff, the, the stuff on the previous slide. We've been looking at ourselves and we've been you know, working on ourselves, but we failed to look outside as well. We failed to really listen to the constituency. So we received questions about when can we actually give you a call? What can you do for me? Which shocked us a bit because we were under the impression that we were really reaching out to them and we really had good discussions on what we could do for them. Um, without us noticing, we also noticed that the well, we saw that the, uh, the, the constituency obviously became more mature, so they need different sets of information from us. Uh, there's also a, a, a big swing towards larger um, organizations have their SOC, Security Operations Center. They become more mature, so they need a different way of interacting with the C-cert uh, to, to you know, get the same value that we used to offer to other organizations. Our constituency, most of them are getting more mature as well. So all the stuff we keep push pushing out on a daily basis with all the details about, you know, for example, uh, run-of-the-mill vulnerabilities. Do we really need to do that? Um, also, one, one issue is that um, becoming more mature and becoming more embedded in, in uh, our ministry is that we become more accountable as well. And that is painful in the sense that we notice that a simple... Letter of intent, for example. Uh, someone presented us with a letter of intent recently. Could you please help us with this project? And we said, yes, we'd love to, really, we'd love to. However, you need a signature. That's difficult because in our uh, ministry, we've got two towers. The one is the Ministry of Safety and Justice. 
and there are about two and a half thousand lawyers in that tower, and that's where I work. So lawyers and signatures, that's difficult. So, um, and th that's challenging, because if you wanna, you wanna uh, improve your stuff, if you wanna cooperate on, on, on projects, um, you need to work together in uh, a, a more spontaneous way. You need to be able to you know, say, yes, I'll be able to do this without going through layers and layers of lawyers. I, don't get me wrong, I, you know, lawyers are our best friends because we, they keep us from breaking the law. Uh, but it would be really good to, um, uh, to be a bit more flexible. And I know this sounds all very bad, but it's not all bad. So we've got, we had a, a couple of very good examples where we thought, Right. We might be doing the, good, the, the right things. Uh, you probably recognize the gentleman there. It's Mr. Holden. Uh, a couple of years ago, he, had the, he found an enormous data set online uh, with lots of personal information. And we handled this as an incident. So we asked him, could we please have the information for NL? Because that would really help us help our country and our constituency. Uh, he said, yeah, sure. There you go. And before we know it, we were stuck with an enormous database of personal information. So that's when we rediscovered our policy department and our legal department and said, yeah, um, this is all very good and we need to help our constituency, but if you share it any wider than our constituency, uh, we're breaking the law and that's not a good thing. So together with, um, with our legal department, we were able to find a way of still spreading the information we needed to spread uh, without actually breaking the law too much. So we used uh, good friends, partners um, to disseminate the information for each, each for our own, uh, own constituency. Also, the, um, I, I like the IE one. Uh, IE had a vulnerability a couple of years ago, uh, which was a run-of-the-mill uh, vulnerability. We noticed that the vulnerability, you know, in, in our matrix, in our, in our set of, in our assessment, we said it's medium probability that this will, will be exploited, and when it's ex exploited, it will have medium damage. Um, our parliament didn't really agree, so they started asking questions in parliament. Why did the NCSC say it's only a medium, medium vulnerability? Because, etc. cetera. Um, and why haven't you uh, told people to migrate to Firefox, Google Chrome, or any different browser? Um, and that's where we also had the help from our policy department. Our policy department is very close to us, um, and we um, find them very easily. So it's, it's very easy to you know, just walk over to their desk and, and ask for their help in uh, in these cases. So that's, that's one extra step of, of um, uh, maturity, basically, that we've uh, noticed. And I'm not sure if you know him, he's the uh, patron saint of the internet, uh, Saint Isidore. Uh, we've got our national uh, exercise come up, com coming up this year. Um, it's called Isidore, uh, and we're including the rest of the community, basically. It's about 42 organizations that uh, deal with cybersecurity in Holland. They're all included, um, and we're um, practicing uh, the, the, the lines, the communication lines between the organization up to the ministerial level. So across the country, the, the main players, or some of the key players, uh, will actually be involved in the practice uh, or in the, in the exercise that we're running. So that's another sign of maturity, I hope. Additionally, this is all very boring, but we're part of the um, uh, national crisis structure, which means that we also have a set of a predefined set of roles, and we have a predefined set of exercises per role uh, in the crisis structure. So um, we know what we need to do before act there's act an actual crisis. So, for example, in the one crisis thing, uh, we started working according to this um, structure. And that's taken away a lot of stress, simply because we know each and everyone's got their role. My role uh, means that I've got a particular role in the crisis structure, uh, which means that I, I know my seat at which table I need to take, and I, know, I, need to, I, know, I know which actions I need to do. And that goes for the rest of the team as well. So in preparing for this type of stuff, it really helps to have your stuff documented. We're not there yet. Um, so, uh, n some of the next steps, I think, and th that's, that's also a request to you, um, please let's see what we need to do to better reach our constituency. And also, please let's have a look at how we can change the stuff we do. For example, our watch and warning service, which really looks outside. Uh, we, we track, I don't know how many sources, and we send out, I don't know how many advisories. Um, 
we're, we're looking for a, a, a different way of approaching that. Same goes for finding skilled personnel. How do we go about doing that? Um, we don't know yet, but we're currently in the process of, of, of starting a project to get more people inside. Be it because uh, b b the approach might be that we need to have a different approach um, in, in training them. We might have to have a look at uh, our, our uh, universities to get the people that are fresh from university into our office. And then what about the training um, um, path? And also uh, reach out to other partners in, in this community that have the same uh, challenges as we, as we have. This was the team of runners. You won't believe it, but they, they were actually, had been running for about, I don't know, 44, 45 hours. Uh, and they were still quite fresh and very, very relieved to be in Rotterdam after a grueling 48 hours or 43 hours of only running and, and becoming very tired. The, 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 the killer really is um, at the end of the run in Rotterdam, you've got the Daniel de Hoed Clinic, which is a cancer uh, 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 a hospital where they cure cancer patients or they, they treat cancer patients. And these patients are outside in their beds and, and with all the stuff, making very clear that they're patients. And after 48 hours of running, not sleeping, not having enough food, your mental stability is gone. It's, it's definitely, so it's a tear fest running, um, you know, running um, um, uh, by, by, that, um, uh, by, by that hospital. Anyway, this was our team. This is the main, me uh, main message. So I hope you recognize the stuff I've just been talking about. And this is the team uh, that have been working on the initiatives we've been doing. As you can see, a very wide variety of, of teams, of organizations, not, nation not all national, not all governmental, not all uh, sectoral. You know, it's, it's a mesh of, um, of various uh, across the board, across the uh, the, the, the community, obviously there's the, the, the first that's got a very important uh, role in, in, in facilitating uh, the, the people from, from the first. Uh, they've been very active in, in pulling this forward. Um, and basically all the stuff we think is very important in helping the CSAP maturity and making sure people realize it's not about the technology, it's about the processes, etc. These people uh, have been helping have been doing the work basically. So thank you very much to those people. Now, last slide, but one, I think. Um, an open invitation. If you wanna have more discussion on this topic, please reach out to me or to any of the people in the, in the, in the slide just now. Um, or, and or visit the next talk in the, um, I believe, management track. They're in the auditorium. It's more on CSAP maturity. How do you reach CSAP maturity? How do you, go, how do you approach um, going towards CSAP maturity and, and also um, maybe even certification? Uh, that will really help, I think. What we need to do is, is start up and, and continue the discussion on this and we need fresh insights. I'm not sure, is there any time for questions? One question. Any questions? You don't let me down, Kautra, thank you. I actually challenge you to invent a, yet another layer of maturity. And that is the maturity of third to third cooperation. Nice. How we alert each other, how we handle incidents together, how we analyze malware together, how we deal more complex cases together. We, are, we are, have defined maturity scale for internal processes, maybe something on the how we pr produce output, but not really on the how we cooperate and really on the global scale. We actually had a very good exercise on global scale cooperation just a couple of weeks ago, and I I think we didn't score a perfect 10 on that. Uh, so I think we have uh, some work to do, uh, in addition to what you have already done, yeah. which I would like to thank you for, 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 your, for your efforts. Just yes. a comment. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. That's, that's one of the steps that we haven't really done yet. Uh, there are some, some steps going towards that issue, uh, or at least in the European perspective. Uh, but it's definitely something we need to 
uh, give more attention to. And if I, if I can bother you for some questions after this, uh, and, and in, in the period of time after this, um, that would be really good, because I think that that's still one of the issues that we need to tackle. Hi. Uh, this is basically for clarification. You spoke about two incidents yep. uh, in your region uh, that uh, uh, where your, your team was really critical. Uh, can you uh, go back and, and talk a little bit more in detail about them? Uh, there was one in, in 2011. Yeah, and, the, yeah, the Diefenauter one. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, um, what we noticed there is that uh, we were prepared. We'd been working uh, as a team for quite a number of years, but we realized that we didn't really, we weren't prepared for a, a national scale incident. What happened? Uh, can you give us a little bit of background? Of course, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, what happened was the, uh, one of the national PKI um, uh, root certificates or root certificate, certificate providers was actually compromised. So um, uh, the, the, the certificate of the state of the Netherlands, so the, you know, the, 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 the government certificate was compromised. So there was no way of being able to trust communications between our IRS or other government services oh, wow. uh, in the browser. Okay. And at first we thought, well, you know, we can manage without talking to the IRS for a couple of days, that's fine. We'll just request different uh, certificates. And then what we found is that, well, certificates are not only used in um, browsers, they're also used in machine-to-machine -machine communications. And what happened was uh, Microsoft had prepared a patch to um, revoke the trust of this particular certificate. And we thought, if they're going to revoke this, if this patch is going to be going to be installed, there is no uh, communication possible anymore. Okay. So. That is why uh, we asked Microsoft to please, for NL, stop that patch so that we'll have some more time to you know, get, get different certificates, in, uh, uh, investigate where these certificates are actually stored, installed, and make sure to, to renew them. Wow. So, and, and what were the lessons that your team learned from that incident? That we were not, well, we needed to learn about the uh, crisis management. We needed to learn to send home people. So our processes were there for actual contents, but not for the stuff around it. So, you know, the food, we only later discovered that you can't survive on sweets. Uh, you need solid food if you have a, a, an incident that takes a week or two weeks to, to run. Uh, also, you need to send people home. You, know, you need to have a schedule. You, you can't be here for three days in a row. You need 12-hour shifts, and then if you have had that shift, go home, make sure that someone else takes your role. So that's the sort of stuff that... The, 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 um, the process stuff is what we learned. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Martine, thank you very much. Not a problem.